That would be great. So we're continuing our series in Zechariah, Rejoicing in the Day of Small Things. And it's a study of the first eight chapters of this book. It's a minor prophet, Zechariah. And God has called Israel back to him. So we're post-exilic Israel. The 70 years of their exile in Babylon is over. And God's message is, I want you to return to me. I want to, um, I want us to get back together and I want us to be in relationship together. So the way I like to think about what this first chapter is about is I kind of think of it like a DTR. That's a define the relationship conversation. So when I was on staff with crew, we use that term all the time. When you're working with college students, there's a lot of DTRs going on. And I remember we would go on a summer project and it was, we would spend eight weeks together in this one motel called the Palm Motel in Santa Monica. And it was kind of a dingy motel and a little janky, but it served our purposes. But there was this table like off to the corner with two chairs, and that we called it the DTR table. So if you saw a young man and a young woman there, woman sitting there, you knew stuff was going down and they were having a conversation about their relationship. And so that's what's happening. God is saying to Israel, hey, um, things have been hard between us, but I want us to restart. I want you to come back. I want you to be my people and build my house. But there's an elephant in the room, right? There's an elephant. There's a big problem um, that, it, that God is going to need to address this with Israel. And that is, Israel probably can't help but feel the, the weight and the pressure of the situation, right? Israel must be asking themselves, okay, that sounds really good, but um, we have failed to uphold our side of the covenant for centuries. I mean, going all the way back to Moses, as soon as God called his people out of Egypt, it only took them not long before they were making a golden calf, before they were stranded in the wilderness for 40 years. I mean, just every step of the way was struggle, struggle, struggle until God actually exiled them and said, I am sending you away from, from Israel. That was traumatic to get kicked out of Jerusalem, to see their temple destroyed. And now God's saying, hey, I want you to come back to me. Let's do this again. And I have to imagine Israel's going to feel a little skittish about that. You want us to come back again? Do you see how horrible it was with us? What hope do we have? And so I think that is what um, we all can feel in our relationship with God. There is pressure to be in a relationship with the God of the universe, okay? And, and you know, he, if, if, when you come into a relationship with God, you're gonna hear him say some things like, if you follow me, I want you to be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect. The way Christ loved you, he died for us. That's our standard. We need to resist temptations we need to resist the cosmic forces of the world that want to destroy our soul. No biggie, right? That's pressure. And so Israel must be feeling it, and sometimes we can feel it to the point that we want to run away. We don't, want to even, we don't think we can enter into this. It's too difficult. I'd rather not even start that. Or we can begin to deny when we're in a relationship with God. We don't want to face the ways we're struggling. Or maybe we... We decide we don't want to believe anymore. We start to maybe find reasons why faith in God isn't really what I want to do. Because you know what? It's all just too hard to maintain. And so Israel, God, what God's going to have to do is he's going to have to speak to Israel. And he's going to have to transform them from a, uh, you know, an uncertain, ashamed, and uh, a lowly people who are languishing, and he's going to have to transform them into a confident, covenant-renewing, temple-building, justice-keeping people. And what we know is that Zechariah succeeds at that. God succeeds because of the message of this book. They are transformed. 
And so what today's message is about is about the bedrock, the foundation that God is going to lay to make sure that Israel feels confident to come back into a relationship with him, even though they have failed to uphold their side for so long. He's going to have to lay this bedrock, and it's a bedrock we're going to need to tap into to know that we can be confident in our relationship with God. So today will be about laying that foundation. Last week was the thesis of the book of Zechariah, which is really the thesis of the Bible. God saying to us, come back to me. Come, I have come to you. I want you to come back to me. And today he's going to say, but here's why that's possible. So let's jump in. We're in verse 7, chapter 1. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Bechariah, son of Edo, saying, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. And then I said, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth and behold, all the earth remains at rest. Then the angel of the Lord said, O oh Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years? What we've come to now in Zechariah is our first of eight visions. Now what God does with visions, the kind of the purpose of visions in the Old Testament is typically to encourage his people. It's typically to inspire them when things look like they are going in a bad direction or things are very difficult. He's going to give them a vision to inspire them of what activity he is going to do or is doing. This makes sense. When things look bleak to our eyes, God allows us to see a vision of a reality that is so much better than what we can see with our eyes here on earth. He gives us a view from heaven, and so he gives us a vision because we're stimulated visually as human beings, right? We like to see it, um, and so that is what, what God is doing. Um, he's trying to stimulate faith. So that's typically what a vision is. And that's the book of Zechariah. It's about rallying and inspiring God's people with what he's going to do. And he, he represents that concretely through these visions. Now before I jump into the exposition of this vision, I, just a word about how does God use visions today? Is that still a way that he operates and so, you know, the, the kind of the quick answer, that could be like a whole gospel academy on that question alone. But the kind of the quick answer is that we believe that the canon of Scripture is closed. And what we mean by that is that we believe that God has spoken authoritatively through the prophets and then it finally through his son, right? That's the book of Hebrews, that God has spoken through his son. And so that is actually the supreme way that God has spoken is through, his, through Jesus, which is represented through the apostles and their writings and when that generation died their writings were ended and the canon was closed and so we believe that scripture is God's authoritative truth about himself about spiritual truth for all people for all time no matter where or when you live this truth from the bible is authoritative we call that sola scriptura which means only the bible is our authority on matters of spiritual truth. But that doesn't mean that God still doesn't use other ways to build up and complement scripture and build up his people. And in fact, we know that because in the book of Corinthians, 
Paul uh, is going to unpack this idea of gifts of the Spirit. And he's going to say that God gives his people what, we, what he calls manifestations of these special gifts. And these gifts include things like gifts of miracles, gifts of healing, gifts of prophecy, gifts of wisdom and knowledge, gifts of tongues, gifts of interpreting tongues. And so what that is saying is that there are ways in which God builds up his people that come alongside scripture. They're not thus says the Lord, not written down authoritative, but they're ways in which God helps his people understand how to live out in their current circumstances. It of course has to fit in within biblical scripture. So for example, I'll give you some examples so we can see this. If you do missions work or follow missions work, you will hear story after story after story of people, especially like in the Middle East or in the frontier, you'll hear them say that the way they came to know Jesus was Jesus appeared to them in a dream. And they're not sure what to make of it, but what tends to happen is they find a true Christian or a church and they explain that to them and then they believe. Because God broke through in a dream or a vision in a special way. So way too many stories of that happening for us to deny that God's spirit works that way. In fact, uh, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, now crew, was started by Bill Bright because of a vision he had. He shared this very intimate vision. He cries when he shares it. He didn't share it often, but he did, did come out that he was praying and he got a vision of college students reaching the world, just multitudes of college students, and he believed God was calling him to start the ministry. That ministry eventually, because of that, I got saved. So I'm thankful Bill Bright got a vision about that. I myself have had one dream where I believe that God spoke to me audibly for a person. I didn't know this person. This person didn't know me. I know who they are, but they don't know who I am. And so I believe God called me to pray for them. I pray for them to this day. So what we believe God is doing, what we can say about that is that, look, God doesn't, the Bible doesn't talk about college students. It doesn't tell me to pray for this person by name, but it tells us to reach the nations. It tells us to pray for all people. So those visions and dreams help us, helped Bill Bright, help me, help us in different situations, live out God's commands in our moment. So now I feel completely a strong conviction to pray for this individual. I would not have felt that without that dream. So here's how, here's how I'm gonna say this. God can use um, gifts of the Spirit including dreams and visions, to encourage God's people to faithfulness as defined by Scripture, but suited for the particular circumstances of their lives. So we want to invite God and be attentive to how he works that way. Those kinds of visions and dreams and gifts need discernment. They are not authoritative in our life. So if someone came to us with a vision for our church, we will weigh it. We're not going to say, oh, well, that's God's will. We have to weigh it together. But we're excited to see God's spirit move in that way. We're excited to see the Spirit move in, in each of us to help us live faithfully now according to Scripture, which is for all people at all times. And I just want to reiterate um, you know, the announcement you heard from Nicole that we want to invite you to do a work of art. It could be a poem, it could be a mural, it could be a dance, it could be a painting, whatever. But we hope that God's Spirit would give you visions and dreams or or some kind of visual encouragement from the sermon series that you can then put down into paper or put in some kind of art form and we want to display it. Because remember what I said, of the point of a vision is to encourage us in being faithful to help us follow God's will. And so we would love to have however God inspires you to represent whatever way he's encourage, encouraging you to represent that visually, we want to put it up for all of us. Maybe in the lobby, maybe on social media, depending on what it is. So please, uh, just go for it. You know, let God fire you up. Use that gifts. I probably will not be painting anything. It's not my mode. I know Nicole said we're all artists. I had struggled to believe that for a minute for myself. But I know that I, I'm excited to see how God will work. 
So let's, what is this vision about? We, it, this one is not, there's gonna be some harder ones, but for now, we start off with this, these four horses. Um, and so th- there's four different kinds of horses. Zechariah isn't very clear what those four horses mean. We know in the book of Revelation that there are four horses. Each horse has a specific function. So that might, this may be a precursor to that. Probably the, the horse that stands out is the red horse, right? So we know from, from the book of Revelation and from ancient uh, times that red would have represented war. Warfare would have represented blood. Um, so it's kind of an intimidating horse. Probably reflects God's kind of battle-ready uh, uh, posture. And actually the book of Zechariah is going to have a battle theme to it. Um, and so, But the bigger idea is that these horses um, go on patrol. And so what that communicates to God's people is that this is God's domain. You only patrol areas that you have jurisdiction over. So God is saying, this earth belongs to me. I am checking out and supervising all that is happening. And they are to report to me so I can uh, act accordingly. And so they report back to him. And the big report is, all the nations are at rest. What are we to make of that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think Zechariah is pretty clear that it's a bad thing. All the nations are at rest. In fact, we're going to hear soon that God's angry because all the nations are at ease. And the real clue is that the angel is bothered by this report. The angel does not like the circumstances. And so we hear, you know, what do we hear him say? How long, O Lord, will you have no mercy on Jerusalem? which you've been angry these 70 years. And so what the situation is, is all the nations are at ease because God has stepped back from his people and allowed them to languish a little bit. Now he's not fully abandoned them, we know that. He's still with them. But in a sense, he's allowed them to languish in exile and the other nations have all increased and are feeling pretty good about where they're at in the world. They're all doing quite well, but God's people are struggling And the angel is not happy about this. And he says, this is not the way it's supposed to be. How long, O Lord? It's been 70 years. Now I see a little bit of irony in that. Is 70 years really a long time to God? I mean, elsewhere he's going to say a thousand years is like a day. It's not a long time at all, but here's this angel like, oh gosh, this has been so long. What we're seeing is that heaven is very uncomfortable with God's anger towards his people. And 70 years, when it comes to God's anger, feels like forever. And he's interceding. He is advocating for Jerusalem. We got to stop this. And So let's see how God responds to the angel's advocacy for Jerusalem, the situation of his anger towards his people, why all the nations are feeling good about themselves. Verse 13, and the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said to me, cry out, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. And I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while while I was angry but a little, they further the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord. And the measuring line shall be stretched over Jerusalem. Cry out again. Thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. I want to go back to my DTR analogy. Anytime uh, a man is going to talk with a woman about their relationship and their true feelings for each other, I always recommend that as uh, a form of leadership and of courage, that the man takes the first step in disclosing his honest intentions and feelings. 
that he takes on that risk to say, here's where I'm at, so that the woman can feel safe to respond to his true intentions. And I believe that that is what we see God doing here. He has invited Israel back into a relationship with him. He has them at that special table, that special DTR table. He's invited them and he says, here is my honest feelings and intentions. So that Israel can feel safe to engage back with him. And so let's see, let's just soak in the language that we hear from God to his people. Right? This language is overflowing with strong feeling words. God is going to over, God is going to come forward as a lover, as a a father, as someone who cares for his people. And he's going to say, I am jealous for you. And I'm angry at the people who've hurt you. He's going to say that I have returned to you with mercy. I'm going to make you happier than you've ever been before. You know, there's an impulse for sometimes for husbands to say to the women, I want to make you happy. I want to build your dream house. It's going to be amazing with me. Well, God says that to them. Your wildest dreams are going to come true with me. My cities are going to overflow with prosperity like you can't imagine. I again choose you. I want to comfort you. If I were to summarize this whole section, I want to zero in on this one phrase. As he invites Israel back into a relationship with him, as they may be struggling with their 500 years of failure, 70 years of exile, this one phrase stands out that he says to them, I have returned to you with mercy. My house shall be built in it. He's saying, my posture towards you, Israel, is nothing but love. I am moving on from all of your past sins. That's what that means. It's all in the past. None of that affects the way I'm looking at you right now. I am all in with you. But a question might arise. Could that change? Could it go back to anger? I mean, what if we blow it again? That's why this next part is key. My house shall be built in it. You see how closely attached those are? I'm gonna come with mercy and my house shall be built in it. He just, those two go together. And so this is an interesting feature of God's plan of renewal. If you read Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, the temple plays a key part of this. Now, I've kind of been perplexed as to why that is. And I I go back to the first time the temple was built. Do you remember this? This is when King David had built up Jerusalem. He had made his own palace. And he's like, God, I need to build you a house. This This is pathetic that I'm in this nice house and you're in a tent. Do you remember that? And do you remember how God responds to that? He basically says, oh, David, you're such a good guy. You know, that it was in your heart to do that. But you know what? I've been in a tent this whole time. I'm fine. I'm God. I don't need a house of cedars. But you know what? I got a better idea, David. I'm gonna build you a house. So when God, when David presents this temple building idea, God's deflective. He's kind of like, eh, all right, fine. You know what? Your son will build it. But for now, it's about what I'm building. But when it comes to post-exilic Israel, notice how God is. He's like, hey guys, let's get to work. What you doing? You're, you're, you're getting lazy here. You're not, you're, this is the eye on the prize. Let's build this temple. Let's build the temple. What's, the, what's going on here? Why is God so big on the temple? Well, first of all, you know, the fact that he wants to renew his covenant relationship with Israel means the temple has to be built. 
Because it is the way in which God um, is present with his people is through the temple. It mediates their relationship. It's how they are able to relate to one another is through that temple sacrifices, through the priests worshiping at the temple, ministering to God, ministering to the people from the temple. But actually, I think there's something more going on we're going to see throughout the book of Zechariah is the temple not only represents God's presence, it represents a promise. What God is going to go on to say is that I'm going to do something with this temple that's never been seen before, never been done before. And so we're going to see, we're going to meet this servant of God called the branch. And this branch man is going to do something with the temple that, we, that the Israelites couldn't even comprehend at this time. He's going to do something profoundly new with it. There's going to be this king coming, humble, mounted on a donkey, and he's going to rule the earth from this temple and bring peace to the earth from this temple, and all the nations are going to come and worship. In other words, the temple is not only his presence, it's a promise where God is saying, what I'm going to do with this temple is going to guarantee that my mercy never leaves you again. Because from here on out, we're, we're, it is, I am all in forever. We are almost at the finish line of this old covenant thing. You know when you run a race, like you run a mile race, the first three, you, do, you, you know you pace yourself, but that last quarter mile, especially that last 200 yards, you kick it up a notch. You start running towards that finish line. That's how God's feeling about this temple. We're almost there. The next big thing I'm gonna do is my servant is coming. And it's from there I am guaranteeing your ultimate victory with me forever. Never again will you go into exile. And so what happens is Jesus comes and Jesus' message is confounding because what does Jesus say about the temple? Oh, hey, you see that temple? It's not that big a deal. It's gonna get destroyed and it's, gonna, it's just gonna lay there. But you know what? I'm the new temple. When this body gets destroyed, it's gonna get raised up forever. So we can kind of understand the consternation of Israel being like, wait a minute, you just said that this temple is so important and now his Messiah is coming and saying, no, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Which is it? And Jesus is saying, look, I am the true temple. I am God's presence with you. I am the place of the ultimate sacrifice for your sins and the sins of the world. And this was supposed to be so marvelous. This truth was supposed to be so glorious that it would be easy for God's people to look at that physical building and say, oh yeah, forget that. Forget that. It's kind of like, imagine you've been working for years with an Apple IIe computer, if you know what that is, if you were born in like, what, the 80s, which I was. One of the first Macs put out for mass consumption, Apple IIe, and you had a rotary phone. And you're working on that and someone shows up with an iPhone 13. You're supposed to be able to say, oh yeah, forget all my that. But what you might do is you might struggle. This is such an amazing device. You might be like, I don't know about that. And that's kind of what happened with Jesus is it was too amazing for them to comprehend. So that's why Christ, when he was ministering on this earth, what was his big dilemma? What was his big criticism of his people, even his own disciples? You're hard-hearted. What does he mean by that? Don't you know who's in front of you? They're asking about the temple. They're wondering about him like destroying Rome. And Jesus saying something greater than the temple is here. 
Something greater than Solomon is here. And his whole message, his whole message was to say, look, here's the big idea. All of those promises that you read in the Old Testament and about the temple, all of that is now fulfilled in me. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is receive. What Jesus is saying is he is the fulfillment of this word to Israel. I have come to you with mercy forever in the person of Christ. Our job is to receive that. The big task that God has for each of us is to receive God's mercy through Christ. He is at the DTR table with you. Maybe for the first time, or maybe because you've struggled in your relationship, and he's inviting you to sit down in his message to you. He comes out first and says, I've got nothing but love for you. It's all mercy for you. I will not treat you according to your failures ever again. If you would believe and receive that from me through Christ's death on the cross for your sins and his resurrection as the new temple that you are a part of forever. So this is the small thing. We're talking about rejoice in the day of small things. This is the small thing I want to call us to do as a church this week. Last week it was return to the Lord. But we need to connect it with this week. The small thing is receive God's mercy. Now that is no small thing. What I mean by small is not unimportant. It's everything. Small as in simple. The simple gospel. To come back to that and receive God's mercy. I was talking about foundation, laying a foundation. Last week, I had a fun conversation with one of our volunteers, Ben, who is a civil engineer. And we were talking about the Millennial Building. Is that what it's called, the Millennial Building in San Francisco? And it is, what's up? Millennium Tower. It's a residential building that is leaning and it's costing millions of dollars, 100 millions exactly, to kind of put it back in place. And the reason why it's leaning is because the, 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 the builders didn't drill their foundation down to bedrock. They, they cut corners or they saved money and they drilled. They just tried to calculate just enough and it turns out it wasn't enough. They had to get down to bedrock to handle the weight of that building. Church. What is the bedrock of our relationship with God? So that when we tap into that and anchor into that, no matter the weight of the world or the struggles in our relationship with God, this is the foundation that keeps it up. It's this word, Jesus saying, I have come with mercy. That is the bedrock of our relationship with God. That is the foundation. There is a scene in Ezra where they build the foundation of this temple. So Ezra is the historical account of what's happening during these prophecies. They build the foundation. They have a huge celebration. It's just the foundation. Why would they celebrate that? Because that's the hardest part. That's the most important part. Because once you get the foundation, then you just got to build on it. From there, it's downhill. The foundation, any engineer will tell you, that foundation is the most important part. That's the case here. Rejoice in this foundation. Throw a party between you and God and all of us that we can receive God's mercy. I just want to close by applying this in a few areas of our life. We need to receive God's mercy specifically in a few areas and we can see this a bit in this passage. We need to receive God's mercy when we feel alienated from others, this could be a particularly painful part of life. Israel was despised by the nations. They wanted to put their thumb on them. They sometimes got the best of them. 
And they could, that could make them feel discouraged. Excuse me. That can make them feel discouraged. That can make them feel um, desperate. And we can feel that way. If you've lived this life, you've been discouraged by feeling rejected, by feeling unloved, by your own failures, your own, the own thorny parts of your personality that maybe others don't like as much, or maybe whatever, for whatever reason, just relationships are painful. Maybe because you're just a Christian, you've gotten rejection. Maybe you've tried to do the right thing, you've gotten rejection. There's a lot of reasons, and that is painful, and there's not much that can take that away. But we need to hear this message. Just as Israel would have heard this in the midst of their struggles, you need to hear this message. God is jealous for you. God looks at you with hungry eyes of love. He wants to be with you. He has given up everything to be with you, withholding his, not withholding his own son for you. He has chosen you and it wants to comfort you. you. We need to hear that from the Lord when we feel alone, alienated, isolated from others in the sting of relationships. Can you receive God's mercy where he says, but I am jealous for you. I made you. I redeemed you. Can we hear that from God? Can we find refuge in God's mercy when we feel the pain of of hard relationships. We need to receive God's mercy when we feel alienated from God. That was something that particularly struck out to me as a pastor when I read the losses in those cards as I, we prayed over them, is how, how people have struggled with sin, falling back into sin, even wondering if God is even working in their life. You know, and that's something, that's something we all will feel at times. We will all struggle with that at times. Maybe I haven't been in prayer enough. I haven't been in the word enough. I have a grudge that won't die. I have anxiety I can't shake. These can make us feel like something is wrong with our faith. This can make us feel like we're, we're lame Christians. We will all struggle with that. And God is, is, what God wants us to hear is this word, return to me because I have come to you with mercy. This is our, Israel's, when Israel's coming back to God, this is the first message they need to hear. The first thing they need to hear from God. It's not God saying, I need you to go do all these things. The first thing that Israel needs to hear is hear God say to them, I have mercy for you, and they need to receive it. That is the first thing you have to do when you are struggling, is you need to hear God say to you, it's all mercy, will you receive that from me? That's our first step when we feel alienated from God. And so if Israel could feel that from God because of the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, how much more can we feel that from him when he gave up the precious, his precious son, his precious blood of his son covers us? How much more do we know and can be confident of God's unending mercy for us when we feel alienated from God? And lastly, we need to receive God's mercy when we feel anxiety about our circumstances. When life isn't turning out the way we have wanted it to, when we have felt deep disappointment, when we have fear about uncertainty about our future, and this was something I felt when Jamie and I lived in the RV for a year. I had to resign from my job. We weren't sure what the future was going to hold. This is not how life was supposed to go. And yet, looking back, what was clear to me, what God was doing in my life, in my wife's life, in our family, was he was saying, but I am with you. I care deeply and am working towards your absolute joy. We need to hear this from this passage. He's telling Israel, your, 
Your cities will have prosperity like never before. God cares about our joy. Now, it, what that means is not that we won't feel disappointment, not that we won't go through difficult times and difficult circumstances, but in the end and through it all, what we will be able to say is what rich time I had with the Lord. What amazing things God did in my life. What mercy he showed me. And I can say that. Having gone through hard things, our, our year in the RV, all of the things I've gone through, and I'm sure you can hear story after story in the church. So we need to receive God's mercy. So church, I want us to end on this idea that the bedrock of our relationship with God, the word we need to hear this morning is to celebrate and rejoice in the foundation that God has come to us with mercy and we only need to receive that. And let us let no person or angel or demon or any force of heaven or hell, any circumstances or any plight ever remove us from doing this small thing every single day that we will receive God's mercy day after day. Let me pray. Lord, it is a small thing and yet um, our hearts can be hard towards the wonderful news that because of Christ, because of your blood shed for us, that our first and primary job is to simply receive your mercy. And sometimes that's the hardest part. But that is the good news of the gospel. That is what you yourself testified to when you came. You said the work of God is to believe and receive me. Lord, help us to do that as a church. You're going to call us to action. You're going to call us to holiness. There are things you want us to do. Yes, there will be pressure. But Lord, the foundation is unshakable. That we have a God of mercy. That you call us back to you time after time. And have nothing but love. Let us walk in that with confidence. Inspire us to works of good deeds, works of worship that we can use to encourage one another to display your kingdom and to be salt and light on this earth. In Christ's name I pray, amen.